Well, hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Um, I'll get our occasion started. Uh, my name's Alex Calder. I'm speaking to you because I'm the head of English Drama and Writing Studies. And I have the pleasure of kicking off our program tonight with a few words about the Alice Griffin Fellowship. Uh, I'll then ask my colleague, Professor Tom Bishop, to introduce tonight's very distinguished speaker, Professor Peter Holland. Uh, following his lecture, we have a reception at Old Government House, and I hope you will all be able to join us for drinks and further conversation. Back in 2006, Mr John Griffin of the United States established the Alice Griffin Fellowship in Shakespeare Studies. It was in honour of his mother, Alice, who for many years was a professor of literature at Hunter College and later at Lehman College uh, in New York City. Her greatest love was Shakespeare, and she was herself the author of several well-known books on Shakespearean theatre. We're truly grateful to John Griffin for the gift of this fellowship, which allows us every year to bring to the university a Shakespeare scholar of international standing for a program of public lectures, seminars, and consultations. We're grateful too to the Hood Foundation for their unstinting support of the Alice Griffin Fellowship. The Hood Foundation, of course, uh, celebrates a recent Vice Chancellor of Fabled Excellence, Dr. John Hood. I must also thank the Lion Foundation for its support of the Hood Fellowships. In any given year, it's said that almost every New Zealander is likely to have benefited in one way or another from the Lion Foundation's generosity to sport, education, health and communities. So you and I are ticking that box for 2015 tonight. Finally, I'd like to thank our professional colleagues in the Faculty of Arts and in the School of Humanities for their assistance in the organisation of this event. And I now invite uh, Professor Tom Bishop to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alex. Uh, there's a couple of people standing there, a couple of chairs down here if you want to make your way. Also some seats towards the end. Um, so feel free to occupy those. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Peter Holland to Auckland as the Alice Griffin Fellow in Shakespeare Studies for this year. Almost everywhere you look in the study and enjoyment of Shakespeare in the present, you find Peter Holland. His erudite, witty, generous and elegant writings on Shakespeare's life, poetry, drama and performance have shaped much of the present landscape of what we do when we talk about, when we think about, when we read about and when we see Shakespeare. He is currently the Macmeal Family Professor in Shakespeare Studies and the Associate Dean of the Arts at Notre Dame University in Indiana. Before that, he was Professor of English at the University of Birmingham and the Director of the Shakespeare Institute at Stratford-upon-Avon. Before that, he was the Judith E. Wilson Reader in Drama and Theatre at Cambridge, where he also took his degrees. He is also a former president of the Shakespeare Association of America, the largest organisation in the world dedicated to the study and discussion of Shakespeare's work. So he is a man who gets around. His work as a Shakespeare scholar, as a writer and a thinker, it seems equally to extend in almost all directions. He is, for instance, a formidably accomplished editor if you've read recent editions of Shakespeare in almost any of the current series, you'll almost certainly encountered some of his work. He edited six plays in the New Pelican series. He also edited uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Oxford Shakespeare and that particularly tough nut Coriolanus for uh, the Arden series of which he has just recently been appointed co-general editor. If you've gone looking for information on Shakespeare's life, You've probably encountered his entry, the longest in the work uh, on William Shakespeare for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. On the honour roll of editorial work, he's also the editor of Shakespeare's Survey, <coughs> an annual compendious review of Shakespeare criticism and performance uh, published by Cambridge University Press. He's co-editor with Stanley Wells of the Oxford Shakespeare Topics series of handbooks, which currently runs to over 20 titles. 
and the co-editor with Adrian Poole of the collection of essays, Great Shakespearean, which is currently at 16 volumes, 18, 18 volumes, two that I didn't see. And finished. And finished. <laughs> His own critical writing extends to considering what counts as drama in the late medieval period, a performance of restoration comedy on which he has a book, uh, and thinking about what theatre history is like, how you do it and how you write about it in a series of books that he has edited and contributed to. And above all, he writes about Shakespeare, uh, where his reviews of productions, uh, his books and essays on traditions of writing and acting and celebrating Shakespeare, his witty dissections of performances of all kinds, high and low, range ever more widely within the expanding zodiac of his curiosity. There are days indeed when I think there must be several Peter Hollands, and there are probably days when he wishes that there were. <laughs> Characteristic of his work is always his creativity with the normal distinctions of genre and areas of inquiry. Like Shakespeare himself, he delights in turning from one register to another and in mixing them up. He's as happy and as accomplished with a rom-com adaptation of The Taming of the Shrew as he is with David Garrick's Macbeth, with Max Miller's stand-up comedy, as with medieval tyrants ranting in Oakley's vein, with textual variants in early scripts, as with YouTube mashups. And his lecture this evening, I suspect, since he hasn't told me all of its terms and surprises, will treat a similar kaleidoscope of materials. On the subject of Shakespearean spinach and tobacco, uh, will you please welcome Peter Holland. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I swear I almost recognize myself. Uh, and because I was told yesterday I really should say so, curatato. That's now, I'm afraid, exhausted my Maori. So this paper is in two parts, as you might anticipate, spinach and tobacco. One, spinach. On the 19th of January, 1940, the Fleischer Studios released a new short animated film. Since it only lasts a little over six minutes, and since very few people seem ever to have seen it, I'm going to show you the whole movie, uh, partly because I guarantee that if, if you remember nothing else of my talk, you will remember the movie, uh, and partly because it will explain the second word in my title, Shakespearean spinach, but especially because, as a moment of cultural definition of Shakespearean performance, it seems to me surprisingly uh, and intriguingly complex. And I'm going then to close watch it before setting it in opposition to the materials of tobacco. Uh, it was, of course, only a matter of time before the Popeye series would tackle Shakespeare. It had, for instance, played with the performance of classical music as early as 1935 in the Spinach Overture with Popeye as conductor. <laughs> But Shakespearean spinach was a part of Dave Fleischer's analysis at this time of live performance in relation to animation and its representation of liveness. The short in this sequence that has most intrigued animation scholars is called Putting on the Act, and it was released six months after Shakespearean spinach. It's an unusual episode because it has no Bluto and no spinach. Instead, it gives Popeye and Olive a backstory, a history, stars of their own show in vaudeville who somehow have got into being toon characters. As the animation scholar Donald Crafton says, it gives them earlier pre-stardom lives, creating an authenticity through their demonstration of their old shtick, as if the toon actors are living stars." End quote. Now, Shakespearean spinach doesn't pretend that the Romeo production at the Spinach Theatre is part of the past lives of Olive and Popeye. Instead, it's simply another setting for the inevitable triangle with its equally inevitable resolution. But it documents a placing of film, and especially animation, in relation to theatre and its connections with other forms of live performance. When Bluto pulls from the wings a stand and turns the page to show the sign death scene, <clears throat> we might see it as a reference to the placards that at this time were thought to have been displayed as scene locators in the early modern theatre. If you watch Olivier's film of Henry V, for instance, you'll see a boy at the Globe Theatre displaying such a sign to the audience to tell them what scene is about to come up. But we can also see it as an example of the signs that announced each act in vaudeville, like the ones that Sweepy will change in putting on the act. 
Assumptions about early modern performance and the practices of variety converge. These ambiguities of location are, I think, apparent in the short's very first sequence as Bluto arrives at the theatre. The building has traces of a Spanish colonial style in its exterior, like the Pasadena Playhouse, built in 1925, and which was, for Hollywood, the epitome of theatre as high culture. But just as American English uses theatre both for live performance spaces and for film, unlike the British English distinction between theatres and cinemas, so the spinach theatre, with its marquee signage and its ticket office centralised under the front canopy, could just as easily be a movie theatre. And its auditorium style, with boxes, can't be defined as uniquely appropriate to live performance given the extravagance of mid-century picture houses. It's the technology of production that separates film from theatre, and Bluto's actions serve to display it, from follow spots to lightning machines and snow. Technology is not new to 1940 theatre, but rather belonging to an earlier era of effects, when they existed at all. I leave out here the rising and falling balcony that doubles as a reference to a fairground test your strength machine, and which is a lovely fantasy piece of set that one day I'd love to build. <laughs> But Bluto's first actions, pulling lines to reveal a succession of drop cloths, also define the state of theatre. It's not the advertisement on the front cloth, which is something I certainly remember from UK theatres in the late 1950s, but the increasingly tatty cloths behind that show theatre's effective poverty. Patched and mended, looking on one cloth as if they're a gigantic pair of oft-repaired bloomers, they represent more than the reality of stage cloths viewed up close and suggest instead that theatre is now in a permanently declining state of make do and mend. There's nothing painted on most of them, only the signs of wear, and startlingly when the last is flown out we see straight through the back wall of the theatre into the street with pedestrians, a policeman and honking traffic. In one sense this is just the scene dock door left open but it's also a statement about the reality beyond and behind the stage. <coughs> Excuse me. A reality from which a text like Romeo and Juliet is sharply disconnected, unlike the authentic reality of film or even animation. Shakespeare is the unreal against which animation and the world beyond and behind the theatre is being placed. <coughs> The sets of this Romeo are, of course, stock rep material, but they can metamorphose into something that's no longer two-dimensional, so that a punch from Popeye can send Bluto flying into the cloth where the lake is now real and he lands with a splash, turning the flat cloth into a three-dimensional space that marks film's refusal of the planes of falsity that theatre needs in order to produce its possibilities of redefining its own fictive spaces. I want to suggest that a moment like that turns theatre into film in its transformation of the landscape drop cloth into landscape itself as location, as the point at which the stereotype of cartoon violence most denies the real. Only in cartoons or cartoon-derived movies can a single punch send someone flying yards into a lake. Perhaps most significantly, the audience is mostly in evening dress, bow ties and tuxedos for the men. But at some moments, it's clear that not all the audience are dressed up to the nines. While the front rows are always wealthy and predominantly elderly, there are also younger people watching that show. Women in ordinary dresses, men in jackets with a turtleneck or t-shirt underneath. The social exclusivity of theatre is being denied here. Or is it a sense of a conflict between what a theatre audience is like and the cinema audience that's watching Popeye itself reinserted into the action. The audience at the Spinach Theatre is nearly as much a social cross-section as at Shakespeare's Globe. Now, of course, the action of Romeo in Shakespearean Spinach is simply reduced to its popular culture and its essentials. There is even less here than is squeezed into a wonderful cell phone advertisement for Nextel, which creates a 30-second Romeo on cell phones, where Juliet awakes with the words, better now, and the Friar Lawrence rings down the curtain with kids. If you've never seen it, look for it on YouTube. <laughs> Romeo in Shakespearean spinach equals nothing more than a balcony scene 
and a death scene without a tomb but with an offstage coffin into which Pluto can nail Romeo, neatly removing Romeo, uh, Popeye's Romeo costume as he does so. The Shakespeare text becomes merely two lines, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo, and parting is such sweet sorrow, which here is Popeye to a knocked out, cross-dressed Pluto. But of course what's most striking is not this extreme compression or fragmentation, but the completely unacknowledged transformation of the play into an opera, and then not even into an expected one. This isn't Gounod's Romeo et Juliette. Now, as I'm sure you all realised, the Romeo-Juliet duet is sung to Achsovrom, Lionel's aria from Flotto's Marta. Well, you didn't all identify it? <laughs> In 1940, you probably would have done. If Flotto's opera has now dropped almost completely from sight, and it was a staple of the operatic repertory across the world, and particularly across the US, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And this aria was the best known and very popular number from it. And I emphasize popular as going far beyond the elite audience of opera. Indeed, the aria is still well known amongst the elite opera audience. There's a YouTube clip of Pavarotti singing it in 1989 as an encore at a concert. And the audience starts to applaud in recognition as soon as the orchestra has played just a bar or so of the introduction. The words in Shakespearean spinach are not the usual English translation of the libretto of the opera, uh, but there are allusions. So Flotto's like a dream bright and fair becomes Popeye's like a beam from above and so on. And since the words sung in opera are assumed to be usually impossible to hear, Olive can simply sing her anger at Bluto without in any way disrupting the performance. Get out, scram, clumsy ham, you're a monkey with a beard. We hear it, but apparently the theatre audience doesn't notice. Now, I can't see any connection at all between Marta and Romeo, other than that the opera is set in a kind of Merry England. Its subtitle is The Fair at Richmond. Fleischer's point is, I take it, no more than that popular, accessible opera and popular Shakespeare belong in the same cultural stratum. This is, 1940, about the last moment at which opera is still able to be seen as an art form enjoyed by a broad social cross-section, and in that sense, properly aligned with Shakespeare. Reducing Romeo to two lines and references to two scenes is the same as reducing Marta to its single highlight. Popeye serves here as a mid-20th century text that fragments Shakespeare to use him to comment on the cultural position of theatre. It doesn't remake him with originality, but accepts what was currently being made in rep Shakespeare production all over America, where balconies and landscape drop cloths were still the norm. Theatre versus film, here animated film, is complexly reimagined. The originality of film is superimposed on the unoriginality of theatrical origins. But the 21st century's phenomenon that I want to turn to next, and for which I haven't found any earlier examples, <coughs> is the remaking of a different text into a Shakespearean form, Shakespeareanizing, if you will, to create a new original from a work with different origins. Now, as I was writing this section, I happened to chance on Michael Billington's review in The Guardian of the stage production of Shakespeare in Love. And he began his review saying, I've often attacked our modern mania for turning movies into plays. What I want to look at and begin thinking about is the current mania for turning movies into Shakespeare, mm -hmm. of making a not very Shakespearean play out of film. It's a very different craze from the long tradition of using Shakespeare for parody from Poole's Hamlet travesty of 1810 onwards, even though there were going to be ways in which there are echoes of Poole's play. Poole's play in 1810 is a travesty of Hamlet. It doesn't seek to turn something else into Shakespeare. The burlesque tradition made, makes something out of Shakespeare. It doesn't make something into Shakespeare. There aren't, as far as I know, mid-19th century attempts to turn, say, Oliver Twist into Shakespearean blank verse. So what is happening in the recent and successful sequence? 
It begins, uh, it includes rather, a revision of pulp fiction as bard fiction by Aaron Greer, Ben Tallon and others, first performed in 2009. Adam Batoche's Two Gentlemen of Lebowski, <laughs> published in 2010. And Ian Desher's William Shakespeare's Star Wars trilogy, published 2013 and still going on now with, into episodes one and two, beginning with Verily a New Hope, then The Empire Striketh Back, and <laughs> The Jedi Doth Return. <laughs> Verily a New Hope reached number 12 on the New York Times hardcover fiction list. It's that popular. You'll find all three in bookshops all over the place, Indeed, I saw volume one in Unity Books this morning. And let me explain that tobacco in my title is simply an allusion to my favourite character in Star Wars, Chewbacca. <laughs> the sequence seems to have begun in 2007 with a mashup of Twelfth Night and George Romero's 1968 cult film Night of the Living Dead as Twelfth Night of the Living Dead, <laughs> a, a 45-minute show that still often gets performed for Halloween. All of these examples share a base in cult film, one with its own enormous fan base. That, and this is the problem, may or may not be theatre-going and may or may not be Shakespeare-aware, as well as they most certainly are film-obsessed. These versions, that have been called neo-Shakespeare, negotiate between small theatre companies desperate to attract a different audience to live performance and the gathering of fan communities in public demonstration of their fandom. In some ways, the productions connect to the decades-long phenomenon of late-night screenings of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, hands up all those who have been to one, uh, for which audiences dress up and perform with the movie in a variety of, of forms, singing along, shouting comments, creating jokes by adding dialogue to the on-screen dialogue and so on. So we could just define this kind of work as mashup and leave it at that. But the epitome of mashup is YouTube, where brevity is key and the unit of film text is often the trailer that is then recut and mashed up with other materials. I can see Shakespearean spinach as a kind of mashup avant la lettre. For the longer expanse of novels, we could use, say, the huge success of Seth Graham Smith's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, 2009, published by Quirk Books, who also publish Desha's trilogy. Others will have to tell me whether Graham Smith's Pride and Prejudice is a parody that can sustain itself across 320 pages. I haven't put myself through the pain of reading it. <laughs> In the very thin stream of Shakespeare novel mashups, there is Christopher Moore's astonishingly vulgar reworking of King Lear with sprinklings of Macbeth as Fool, 2009, in which Pocket, Lear's Fool, ends up married to Cordelia and ruling France. Now, I emphasise here the paucity of these works. I checked recently on the extraordinary fanfic site called Archive of Our Own, and it produced 1,300 Shakespeare mashups, fanfic, slash fic pieces based on Shakespeare's works. 1,300. A search on the same day for Harry Potter listed 62,000 pieces on the same site. Now, the conjunction of Shakespeare and screenplay and bard fiction is the outcome of a wiki. It was a piece of collaborative writing begun in 2009 under the title The Pulp Shakespeare Project and devoted, as the, as the wiki site states, quote, to the reconstruction of William Shakespeare's play, A Slurry Tale, which curiously resembles Quentin Tarantino's film Pulp Fiction. It was first performed in a one-hour version by a company called Tedious Brief Productions. <laughs> Their tagline is, we make plays that are often 10 words too long. <laughs> and a different version called Pulp Shakespeare was performed uh, and won a Best of Fest award at the 2011 Hollywood Fringe. Collaborative writing produced in this version a fluid text of various elements. Tedious Brief Productions went on to create Tempests, which is a mashup of Aliens and the Tempest, with, as it were, Miranda uh, Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> Good though bard fiction is, and I really do like it, I'm not going to say any more about it. But by comparison, Batoche's adaptation of the Cohen brothers' The Big Lebowski was not written collaboratively, but drafted in a single weekend by Adam Batocci. 
Unlike bard fiction, written for fringe performance and still being performed, Two Gentlemen of Lebowski is now unperformable <coughs> because, as it states very firmly, any and all adaptation rights in the film are reserved to the Cohen brothers and to Universal Pictures. And the website insists, for avoidance of doubt, this means that the author is not able to grant stage rights. Self-described as a viral phenomenon, uh, the, this version was performed in 2010 but then pulled and there's not likely to be any further performances. Also, unlike Bard Fiction, which is unpublished, Two Gentlemen of, of Verona was published by Simon & Schuster. It's a fact of considerable significance because what Batocci has done for his play is to construct a full-scale commentary, which Batocci has described as the funniest part of the whole thing. And the commentary is deliberately formatted to mimic the layout of the facing page annotation in the Folger Shakespeare Library edition by Barbara Mowat and, and Paul Wurstein, published by the same publisher, Simon & Schuster. So here's a play from the Folger, uh, uh, an opening from the Folger edition uh, of Two Gentlemen of Verona. Here's another one. And there's an opening from Two Gentlemen of Lebowski. And you can see how uh, carefully the typography is mimicking the, the form of the Folger Shakespeare Library edition. Note, by the way, the gloss, the last gloss on, on the verso. Sexton, not a sexual reference for once. <laughs> as a reading text, then, Batoche's mashup defines itself as not only transforming the Cohen Brothers' screenplay, but also as multiply a commentary on Shakespeare scholarship, something that he learned about through taking three Shakespeare classes as part of his minor in English at Northwestern University in Evanston, just north of Chicago. I asked Shakespeare friends at Northwestern if they remembered him. One of them found that he was indeed in a class she'd taught, but she had no memories of him whatsoever. <laughs> now, since the primary location of fandom is among current or former college students, the intersection with their experience of Shakespeare in edited texts like the Folger Shakespeare Library series is immediately a source of the comic. They know that and can therefore see what's funny about this. And the Folger edition's endearing use of images from early texts can be turned by Batocci at times brilliantly into further punning. I'll come to that in a moment. We can see, though I think Batocci probably couldn't, that it also echoes the games that Poole played in Hamlet Travesty in 1810. Here's some of Poole's notes in 1810. I love the discussion of a rope of onions uh, here. Uh, I do not understand this. This is from Pope. May we not with greater propriety read a robe of onions? In the way as Dr. Johnson, rope is undoubtedly the true reading. A rope of onions is a certain number of onions which, for the convenience of portability, are by the market women suspended from a rope not, as the Oxford en editor ingeniously but improperly supposed, in a bunch at the end, but in a perpendicular arrangement, and so on. <laughs> All of this is written by Poole, parodying the traditions of Shakespeare commentary. But Toch's text and the jokes in his commentary also depend not so much on knowing uh, the two gentlemen of Verona, but on knowing the screenplay for The Big Lebowski, often in minute detail. Take, for instance, the image on this page. <laughs> Nothing explains why there's a picture of a beaver here. <laughs> but since the character here called Jacques Treehorn, Jack Treehorn in, in The Big Lebowski, uh, is a movie maker who makes pornographic films, oh. beaver pictures are exactly what he makes. And so the joke depends on our knowing something that the, that the text of The Two Gentlemen of Lebowski never bothers to tell us. Even more complexly clever, is the note here on, on the apparently bizarre line, I still read Ben Jonson manually. I still read Ben Jonson manually. <laughs> Throughout the film, there are threats made by the nihilists, no, I won't explain, you'll just have to watch the movie, uh, to castrate the other Lebowski, that is to cut off the dude Johnson. So I still read Ben Jonson manually is an adaptation of a line in the screenplay uh, well, I still jerk off manually. <laughs> and it therefore explains Bertocci's tree horns question. I, oh, uh, uh, come back. I, there's the rub. <laughs> <laughs> 
The commentary note completely ignores the reference here to masturbation, while dependent on the reader knowing, without needing to be told, just what's happened to the screenplay. So the, the note is, is, is all about uh, what he's able to copy, and the reference to Ben Jonson is therefore part of it. Uh, it's, it's striking that the, the joke depends on something that absolutely isn't present in this. Fans of a cult movie, of course, know the screenplay by heart. And The Big Lebowski is nothing if it isn't a cult movie. Indeed, for many, including the author of one encyclopedic study, it is quite simply the greatest cult movie of all time. Actually, I don't know another cult film that has generated its own cult, The Church of the Latter-day Dude, <laughs> led by the Dudley Lama, with, by 2012, wait for it, 140,000 self-ordained priests. And also, a quite serious analogy of the film as pseudo-gospel, The Dude Abides, the gospel according to the Cohen brothers. Alongside the gatherings of fans at Lebowski Fests, dressed as characters in the film or as allusions to, the fe to features of the screenplay. So, for instance, people turn up at Lebowski Fest wearing uh, white fur because it's an allusion to white Russians, and white Russian is what dude's favourite drink is. Um, what comes with this is a quite remarkable pseudo-academic analysis in collections of fan essays that are often strikingly learned. Some are packaged like college textbooks, Lebowski 101, or others echo the kind of volumes that I suppose I'm involved in creating, the year's work in Lebowski studies. In this volume, some of the analysis is often no more acute or theory aware than, than uh, serious film articles published elsewhere. And I should reassure you that this is a one-off volume, not yet an annual publication. <laughs> But Batocci layers another form of knowledge over his version, for as well as writing in blank verse, he incorporates allusions to, he claims, all of Shakespeare's plays, and on his website you can download a checklist and tick them off as you spot the allusions. Some are obvious, some are rapid. In the encounter between the chorus, called the stranger in the film, and the knave, the film's dude, a few lines of screenplay yield allusions to Henry V, Othello, Macbeth, Richard III, and A Winter's Tale in pretty rapid order. What sayest thou, mistress, quickly? Brood in the city of the base Indian, there's Othello. Uh, so foul and fair a day I have not seen, there's Macbeth. Uh, uh, the winter of our discontent is ne'er made glorious summer, and then a joke about pursued by a bear. Uh, all in just a few lines. Uh, and one of these is, is I think, uh, really uh, dependent, as the commentary uh, makes clear, let me go to the commentary, uh, on uh, a joke caused by the screenplay's replication of a, of, of a cowboy accent. In the film, the stranger says bar when he means bear. You'll see it on the left. Sometimes you eat the bar and sometimes the bar while he eats you, and so that allows Batocci to pun on not only a talk about bears, but the word might also be bar, an obstacle or impediment. The detailed knowledge is quite extraordinary. Ian Desha, in his Star Wars trilogy, plays with such lightly hidden allusions too. He calls them Easter eggs, like the inside jokes hidden in computer programs. From Nietzsche's Ubermensch staring into the abyss to the story of Oedipus, from a reference to Star Trek, I quote a line from his, screen, uh, his play, To Boldly Go Where None Hath Gone Is Wild, which is quite a good blank verse line, <laughs> to the fact that the actor who played Lando Calrissian in the movies advertised Colt 45s with the slogan, Colt 45, it works every time. So he creates a couplet that goes, a colt is ridden best by kindly rider, I know it is true, it worketh every time. <laughs> and even HMV's lovable dog, Nipper. Now seems it plain to me that Vada doth perform the part of docile dog unto the sickening whinny of his master's voice. <laughs> Dersh's range of reference is extremely wide. I particularly like the allusion to the motto of the US Postal Service in The Empire Striketh Back. For neither snow nor ice nor gloom of hoth shall stay my rescue of my greatest friend. 
And there's a double self-reference in this passage. This is actually a, a, something you need to know about Desha. Um, uh, you shall not sure discover what is right and proper when I blast apart thy frame. Lotus forbidden, General Solo, for in droids aren't masters of divinity. Well, Desha has a Masters of Divinity degree, and he took it at Yale. And this passage is an acrostic. If you read down the initial letters of these four lines, <laughs> there's the word Yale. <laughs> now, there are all kinds of games being played, and some of them are, uh, are far too complicated to go into here. Um, but it's all turned into Shakespearean pastiche, and Desha thanks Murray Biggs, the Yale professor with whom he studied, for having improved my abilities in this. Um, I dread to think what it was like before Murray Biggs helped him. <laughs> it's easy, I think far too easy, simply to mock and leave it at that, patronising his poor verse writing. But I want to make two moves. One is to see how Shakespeare allusions are being embedded in his text and the route towards revealing them. The other, at the end of my talk, is to see briefly, here and in Adam Batoch's work on the Big Lebowski, what Shakespeare means for them. What is their understanding of the word Shakespearean, of which these are neo-Shakespearean forms? What, in sum, we might see as their understanding of the value added that Shakespeare provides for the <laughs> fan's pleasure in the originating text, film or screenplay? Reading The Two Gentlemen of Lebowski without knowing The Big Lebowski is pointless, but there's no read, need to read the, uh, the Two Gentlemen of Lebowski with a knowledge of its antecedents from Verona, beyond the title itself. Now, understanding Desha's approach to the kinds of presences that Shakespeare has in his trilogy is really rather complex. On the one hand, there are allusions that are designedly very obvious. <laughs> Yorick Skull is probably, the, he writes, the image we associate most with Shakespeare, and therefore I couldn't resist writing a similar moment for Luke Skywalker. On the other, there are ones that might give some of us just a moment's pause. The opening of The Jedi Doth Return, for instance. Cease to persuade my growling Gergerod, long-winded moths have ever snivelling wits. It's probably not many of you who realise that it's the first two lines of the two gentlemen of Verona, cease to persuade my loving Proteus, home-keeping youths have ever homely wits that he has played with. And what he does in each of the three volumes is to begin with an opening of a Shakespeare play. So, now is the summer of our happiness made winter by this sudden fierce attack, and <laughs> if flurries be the food of quests, snow on. <laughs> Reading Desha's blank verse shows up what he conceives of as the principal characteristics of Shakespeare's language, but he's very helpfully provided his own analysis available online for each volume on the publisher's website as, wait for it, an educator's guide, each a pamphlet of about 20 pages or so. And I'm still trying to puzzle out or imagine what the pedagogical circumstances might be within which there would be an educator in need of such a guide. <laughs> For each Shakespeare play he quotes or transforms or, or alludes to, he provides a, a, a couple of sentences of summary, a choice of a great film version or two to watch, and then parallels his source, uh, uh, the source with his adaptation and its context. For our concerns, more intriguing than this are his list of some quick and easy elements you'll find in Shakespeare's play, all of which can be found in my adaptations. A list of Shakespearean devices that he's used and his substantial explanation of how blank verse operates. His list of elements you'll find in Shakespeare plays include minimal stage directions, ways of marking asides and soliloquies, including the very curious idea that, I quote, the longest soliloquy by a Shakespearean character is 63 lines spoken by the character Canterbury in Act 1, Scene 2 of Henry V. The problem is, it isn't a soliloquy. He's talking to King Henry V and, and the assembled court. He has the bizarre idea that each play was written in five acts uh, and that Shakespeare did that because ancient Roman plays also had five acts. Neither is true. I forbear to say, oh yeah... Desha's account of blank verse assumes that every foot is iambic, with no room for any trochees whatsoever, 
and it gives him pause because the frequently necessary word stormtrooper, <laughs> which cannot have two initial strong stresses by his rules, has to be stressed on the middle syllable, stormtrooper. <laughs> Throughout this, there is plainly a hope, verily a new hope, that reading his pastiche will encourage his readers to read Shakespeare. I think it's mar far more forlorn as a hope than, than his first volume's title. I can't work out whether Desha's belief that reading his version will lead to reading Shakespeare is naive or hubristic. Reading Desha is often like reading early Shakespeare, especially the Henry VI plays. There's the sheer regularity of the metrical structure of his blank verse. His, uh, in genre may be weird, but the rhythm is always uh, rather dully uh, repetitive. But it's frustrating how little he knows about Shakespearean verse. So when he constructs a love duet for Han Solo and Princess Leia, he proudly notes that he copies the quatrain forms of Romeo and Juliet. But he's never noticed, and apparently Murray Biggs never told him in class, that Romeo and Juliet speak sonnets, complete and truncated. So the result is that his lovers aren't modelling or, or speaking all unaware that their speech has been modelled on the Petrarchan implications of love sonnets. Just occasionally, there is an experiment which offers a much larger clue to Desha's conception of the Shakespearean and its purpose in his work. Now, as I'm sure you do remember, in Star Wars, R2-D2 is, uh, R2 is a droid. He's the short one, the one who never speaks but only beeps. Desha gives him noises that are always firmly in iambic pentameter. <laughs> beep, meep, beep, squeak, beep, 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 meep, beep, wee. <laughs> then, when R2-D2 is alone, he can go into blank verse, <laughs> growing in the course of the trilogy into a concerned and active thinker, a strategist for the rebels, and a sharply percipient analyst of what's going on. As Desha describes it, the plucky little droid is the fool of the trilogy. I go on. A fool not in the modern sense, but in the Shakespearean sense. A knowing presence who aids the action, even though he seems rather simple. And Desha gives him the epilogue to the trilogy. Even thus our tale is finished. Pardon if your hopes diminish. <laughs> if you did not find the sequel satisfying, if unequal, our keen play is unto others. Do not part in anger, brothers. Anybody notice what else is going on in this? No, it's even better than that. If you read the, the, the initial letters of, of the lines, you get episode seven cometh. <laughs> it's another hidden acrostic. Time to take two steps back. The first step would be towards the nature of fandom and our place within it. Recognising that the materials I'm working on depend on at least one kind of fan in, its in the concept of its readership, the fan of the cult film, we can worry about what Shakespeare scholars like myself have to do with this. Fan studies are often concerned to distinguish between the fan and the engaged academic. But Henry Jenkins, who's a principal figure in the study of fans and of convergence culture, describes himself as an Acker fan uniting academic and fan, Acker fan, a hybrid creature, he says, which is part fan and part academic. And he sees his own writing as an attempt to bridge between the two, hoping, as he puts it, I quote, to find a way to break cultural theory out of the academic bookstore ghetto. I love the fact that in Unity books, books of, uh, of theory are under a, a title which says, brainy books. <laughs> That there is also a link between academicism and fandom is clear. As Michael Dobson, currently the director of the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford, put it when he was comparing fans of the Royal Shakespeare Company and fans of the England football team, they share, he says, doggedly masochistic brand loyalty and the self-loathing pathology of fandom, trivia, lists, fanzines, and collections of souvenir programs. So if the distinguishing features of fandom include attending conventions and accumulating souvenir materials, often in highbrow fan, materials that are offered as an ironic commentary on the subject, then almost any academic conference must be full of fans as well as academics. 
with a strict proviso that unlike fans at Comic-Con and, and Lebowski Fest, Shakespeare, Shakespeare scholars at Shakespeare conferences don't dress up as characters in our beloved works, though I gather that at serious Jane Austen conferences, the Janeites do indeed dress up as, as uh, characters in Jane Austen. I was going to ask how many of the academics who work on Shakespeare who are in this room have Shakespeare dolls in their studies, <laughs> but I'm going to prevent embarrassment. I certainly do, uh, quite a large collection of them. Fandom connects intrinsically with the geek, the dork, and the nerd. One recent interview with Ian Desha is on a website called Geeky Library, described as a site of book reviews and news for geeks like us. And Adam Batocci, on a page on his website that serves as an addendum to The Two Gentlemen of Lebowski, discusses at length the font used because, quote, I'm a typography dork, you see. My publisher doesn't do these sorts of pages. I nearly wept when I learned this. And we can see how these terms function as popular expressions of academic study, the obsessive, self-absorbed, neurotic world in which academics live as well as work. Indeed, the failure for most academics to distinguish between life and work might function as a central feature of the neurotics of fandom. One direction would be then to see how Lebowski fans and Star Wars fans are really rather like Shakespeare Acker fans. As Roberta Pearson asks, as she thinks about high cultural fans, the most understudied groups of fan communities, which, she says, of these appellations would fans, buffs, enthusiasts, devotees, aficionados, conoscentes, connoisseurs of Bach, William Shakespeare, Sherlock Holmes, and Star Trek accept, and which not? There's much to be done on Shakespeare fandom. But the other step, the last one I'm going to take, seems more important for now. The creation of these works that I've been looking at depends on a perceived connection between Shakespeare and cult movies. As Adam Batocci notes when he was asked by an interviewer whether he was inspired by mashups like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, I think the difference between those books and mine is my book works better the more you know about the classic source. This project is how close Shakespeare and the Big Lebowski are, not about how much Austin and Zombies contrast." End quote. Well, there are Shakespeare and zombie narratives, in case you didn't know. Uh, for instance, the film Zombie Hamlet, 2012, about the making of a film of Hamlet where, where the person who's financing the film wants zombies included. Uh, and one which I actually quite like, called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are undead, <laughs> uh, where a production of Hamlet reveals a conspiracy of Shakespeare, the Holy Grail, and vampires. Both of these movies are comic parodies, neither suggests a convergence of, rather than a contrast between, Shakespeare and vampires. But what become, begins to become apparent the more I read work on The Big Lebowski is how frequently Shakespeare is invoked by people who, who love that movie, and therefore the extent to which Adam Batocci is tapping into a popular cultural assertion of the Shakespeareanness of the Coen Brothers film. Here, for instance, at one end of the spectrum is Roy Preston, the owner of a shop in Manhattan entirely devoted to Lebowski merchandise, talking about the central figure of the dude. Quote, And what about the dude himself? If you held up a drawing of Shakespeare's Falstaff, wasn't he, after all, just an Elizabethan abider next to the dude, you would probably see a rather striking resemblance. Both are portly bearded white men prone, prone to a love of beverage. Falstaff, he goes on, was so popular in his day that Queen Elizabeth I demanded the character be brought back for two more plays, much as fans today are always clamouring for the, for the Coens to do a sequel to Lebowski. Well, ignore, if you will, uh, the turning of myth into history and the doubling of the Queen's demand. Forget for a moment the idea that one could have a drawing of Falstaff. How, how do we know what Falstaff looked like? What we're dealing with uh, is not only a kind of advanced fluellenism, all overweight drunks are really the same, but also a belief in the way that all audiences' desires indicate not traditional influence, but the presence of a cultural archetype. Here are the co-authors of a serious study in the British Film Institute film classic series uh, of the film, very self-consciously and awkwardly trying to work with an analogy between Shakespeare and Lebowski. I won't read it, I'll leave it there for you to read. 
Ignore, if you can, the re overly positive view of the ending of Shakespeare comedies. Forget whether you can identify one that ends with sexual reproduction. I can't. Uh, for they're trying to connect Shakespeare comedy with the absence of marriages in prospect at the end of the film, and the strangest line in the film's quasi-epilogue that there's a little Lebowski on the way. Or, as Bertocci reworks it, but then the fellow wise is like to know that on the way is a little Lebowski, perpetuating human comedy down through the generations. I actually rather like that line, perpetuating human comedy, which is rhythmically very sophisticated. In an earlier article titled, Is it okay to read the Cohen brothers as literature? Tyree, working this time with Morgan Mice, seems even more desperate. Like a Shakespeare comedy, the Big Lebowski not only becomes funnier during each screening, it also yields such an intricately threaded carpet of motifs that it begins to look pretty deeply piled. <laughs> I, I could explain, but it has to do with the importance of a rug in the film. So what seems to me to be going on in this is that there's a, a, an awareness of a kind of allusion to Shakespeare that they are perceiving operating within the, Shakespeare, within the film text. What's happening in their uh, analysis of the tonal range is often that they find in Shakespeare uh, a range of generic possibilities and find a similar range of possibilities, for instance, in The Big Lebowski. Well, some of this, I think, might work. Um, for Descher, it works rather less well because he wants to find the Shakespearean qualities of Star Wars through Joseph Campbell's once very popular The Hero with a Thousand Pages. Sorry. Uh, there's a long passage he here of his writing about it. I'll just leave it up there. In the end, what is crucial about Shakespeare for these writers is not merely the structures of high cultural value, but familiar familiarity as a sign of a value which Descher calls relevance. He is happy to assert Shakespeare's popularity as comparable to Star Wars, but also as constituting a set of cultural expectations of adequate sophistication. I quote from him, all well-rounded postmodern cultural connoisseurs are expected to have at least a passing familiarity with both sets of stories. Would you please check? Do you know both Shakespeare and Star Wars? If you do, then you're well-rounded postmodern cultural connoisseurs. <laughs> In the high volume sales of fan-linked products, Desha's work itself proves to be powerfully perceived by its consumers as relevant making Shakespeare relevant somehow in the all-about-me world inhabited by the young demographic of, of fans. But what, finally, is the worth of this kind of work as drama uh, or performed or unperformable? Can those postmodern cultural connoisseurs who enjoy Batocci and Desha fill theatres and revive a, a supposedly dying art, apparently in a terminal state of decline, both in the 1940s Shakespearean spinach and now? For Paul Regalus, who's written about this work, the, I quote, the cult success of recent neo-Shakespearean stage adaptations suggests that contemporary stage theatre in the 21st century is not dead, I didn't think it was, rather it simply needs captivating universal characters that a modern audience can know and love. Well, I'm not sure that the two gentlemen of Lebowski is the route to the salvation of live theatre. <laughs> the spinach which will give new strength to theatre as Popeye. In places like Stratford, and I think in Auckland as well, the spinach theatre is in good health. The unoriginality of these neo-Shakespeareans, for all that they tap so superbly into the cult film demographic and their substantial intersection between cult film and the college-educated audience, limits the healthful effects of such makings. We can see its origins all too plainly, but its originality is, I think, even far too temporary to sustain life, even for Popeye. Thank you.